and I have nothing to report from that closed session meeting. Rise, put your hand over your heart, please. Jordan. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, the of the United States, 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 States of America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight, uh, it looks like we're uh, a little bit short up here, but the uh, Director Dransfeld is uh, uh, online, and uh, Mary Otten, the General Manager, uh, it also. Both of them had unexpected uh, reasons for not being able to attend the meeting tonight. But they will be here just the same. Director Magner? Present. Director Dransfeld? Here. Director Roberts? Here. Director Malloy? Here. Chair Kelly? Here. Members to the agenda, please. I'll make a motion to accept the agendas presented. Second. Director Magner? Aye. Director Malloy? Aye. Director Dransfeld? F. Director Dransfeld? She's still on. I believe she's on mute. Okay. <laughs> what was that? I'm so sorry. I couldn't get into the program, but yes. Okay, okay, move along, please. Thank you. Um, sorry. Director Roberts? Yes. Chair Kelly? Yes. Proceed. Good evening, Board of Directors. My name is Kayleen. I'm the Development Analyst with the District. Tonight, I'm going to present an update on our nature education classroom. The Tough Shed has been purchased and blueprints have been received. Um, an inspection of the garage was completed, which resulted in lead paint um, mitigation. And then a demo permit was granted by the County of Ventura. So we're moving along on this project and we're really excited. The garage was demoed last week um, on September 28th. And then this past Saturday on October 1st, we had about 15 volunteers come out and help us with the demo and the cleanup project. In the slides up, coming up, there's about three slides that you'll see, just some photos from the demo. Um, the garage on the left, and then the demo when it began with our parks crew that um, tore down the building. These are some images from our demo cleanup day. We had about six volunteers from Amber's Light that came out and helped us with the project on top of our volunteers. Again, continuing, these are some photos from October 1st. And the very last photo is currently what the garage <laughs> looks like right now, which there is no structure. So um, we are gonna move on to the next step. To date, the foundation has spent $23,219.17. The foundation received a $1,000 environmental grant from Amber's Light Lions Club. The photo there, that is our ultimate goal on what we want the Nature Education Center to look like on the sides of the walls. The next stage, the foundation board is currently working to secure a construction or architect company to draw up electrical plans. 
um, to be included in the permit. Um, we need that in order to get our bold permit. That's where we currently are right now in the process to submit that to um, County of Ventura. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. This is the time for public comment. I have no cards. Uh, do we have anyone who has called in? No one online either. Um, I'll go ahead and give the normal uh, statement just for the record. Um, public comment in accordance with government code section 54954.3, the board reserves this time to hear from the public. If you would like to make comments about a matter within the board's subject matter jurisdiction, but not specifically on this agenda, in accordance with California law, the board will listen, note the comments, and may bring the comments back up at a later date as an agendized item for discussion. Speakers will be allowed three minutes to address the board. Here, this is second call, so if anybody in the audience would like to speak, I, I will allow them to have three minutes. Seeing no one will move to the consent agenda. A motion to approve as uh, presented consent agenda. I'll second. Director Roberts. Aye. Director Magner. Aye. Director Dransfeld. Aye. Director Malloy. Aye. Chair Kelly. Excuse me for just a moment, I, meet, I must read something. Consideration and adoption of resolution 723 replacing the 2016 employee manual and 2019 unrepresented employee manual with a proposed personnel policy manual. That's part of the consent agenda. That's part of the oh. consent agenda. You're going to the hearing. Who wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Approval of a first reading for the adoption of Ordinance 13 and an ordinance of the Board of Directors of the Pleasant Valley Recreation Park District setting board member compensation. We will now hear a presentation. Uh, good evening, directors. Uh, tonight I'll be presenting the ordinance that we are bringing before you. Can you just click on the screen access, please? There we go. Now it works. All right, so summary. Uh, the approval of the first reading will allow for the adoption of ordinance number 13, an ordinance that sets board member compensation to $115.75 per meeting, uh, not to exceed five meetings per month. So pursuant to public resource code section 5784.15, each board member, uh, a board member of the board of directors may receive a per diem compensation for each day of service rendered together with expenses subject to limits set by the law. A little, back, a little more background, at the July 7th, 2021 board meeting, the board of directors adopted ordinance number 12, setting uh, district board member compensation to uh, $110.25 per meeting, not to exceed five meetings per month. Uh, pursuant to Public Resource Code 5784.15 uh, and Water Code 20202, the District Board may increase the daily compensation by no more than 5% for each calendar year following the oper operation date of the last adjustment. Uh, so the proposed Orange 13 has been reviewed uh, by District's Council and has been approved uh, to form. The purpose of this ordinance is to specifically raise the compensation rate of directors by 5%. Uh, that would be a total of uh, $115.75 per meeting. 
This ordinance uh, requires the approval after a public hearing and take effect 30 days after the second reading. Additionally, if, the, if adopted, this ordinance replaces Ordinance 12 in its entirety. So the fiscal impact, uh, the district staff anticipates that the approval of a 5% increase, uh, two days of service, service compensation, a maximum co compensation increase of $1,650 is the fiscal impact. So tonight, the recommendation is that the uh, board review and introduce ordinance 13 by the following. Uh, make a motion to read the complete ordinance title number 13, title ordinance number 13, and ordinance of the board of directors of the Pleasant Valley Recreation and Park District, setting board member compensation uh, to waive further readings. And make a motion to approve the introduction of the first reading of the district's ordinance 13, an ordinance of the board of directors of the Pleasant Valley Recreation Park District, uh, setting a board member compensation. That is the presentation. Oh, <clears throat> questions, questions? Yeah, I, I do have uh, one question. What, uh, with regards to waiving the second reading or doing a second reading, when would it be more appropriate to do it and waive the second reading? So, I, I mean, I, I would imagine that something we're, we're gonna have a lot of public comment on, there would probably be a second reading of, um, versus just waiving the second reading and adopting. So it. we will be coming back to the next board meeting with this as well. So tonight is the first reading of it, and then we bring back this exact same thing again next month. I'm sorry, I thought uh, I thought the recommendation was an or, not and. I apologize. Okay, there was Disregard. I, I don't have any questions. No, I don't have any questions. I'll move the recommended motion. If that's all the questions that the board has. I now declare this meeting open for a public hearing to consider the introduction of ordinance number 13, setting district board member compensation. Prior to the conclusion of the hearing, any interested person may file a written protest with the clerk of the board. A written protest shall state all grounds of objection. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak for the introduction of ordinance number 13 setting district board member compensation? You have three minutes to address the board. Seeing that no one wishes to speak, state an objection. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak against the introduction of ordinance number 13, setting district board member compensation. You have three minutes to address the board. Seeing that no one is stepping forward to speak against, I now declare the public hearing closed. Any discussion? I move that the board secretary conduct a reading by title only of proposed ordinance number 13 and waive further reading of the ordinance. Second. Director Magner? Aye. Director Malloy? Aye. Director Dransfeld? Aye. Director Roberts? Aye. Chair Kelly? Aye. Ordinance number 13, an ordinance of the Board of Directors of the Pleasant Valley Recreation and Park District setting board member compensation. Any discussion? No, okay. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the introduction and first reading of the district's ordinance number 13, an ordinance of the Board of Directors of the Pleasant Valley Recreation and Park District setting uh, board member compensation. I'll second. Director Magner? Aye. Director Dransfeld? Aye. Director Roberts? Aye. Director Malloy? Aye. Chair Kelly? Aye. 
Item 8, consideration and approval of agreement between the district and Ventura Roller Sports. Chairman Kelly, members of the board, tonight I present to you um, an agreement uh, that staff has been working on with a uh, candidate to be a contract operator for the uh, hockey arena out at Freedom Park. So tonight I bring before you the consideration and approval of agreement between the district and Ventura Roller Sports. Um, as you may know, the Pleasant Valley Recreation Park District owns, uh, operates, uh, owns a hockey rink out at Freedom Park. Uh, the district has previously had two contract operators run these hockey programs um, unsuccessfully in the past, and the hockey uh, arena is currently open with the exception of a reserve time for the, for the Derby Darlings who rent the rink from us. Uh, as we stated, uh, the last contract operator that we had left in 2018, ter she terminated the contract. Uh, since that time, uh, the Derby Darlings have been using the, the rink and renting that from us, uh, from the district, um, as regular users. And then uh, just here in the past summer, we've opened up the rink during the day for open hockey, if you will. If all of us wanted to put on our skates and go out there and play during the day, we could do that at no charge. Uh, the parks open it in the morning and Park Patrol closes it at dark. Uh, so anyway, we've been working with uh, Adam Poe uh, since the spring of 2022. Uh, we've been working with him on the language of the contract. Uh, we received a business plan from him and we've also uh, just been talking to him uh, about what kind of hockey programs he'd be uh, operating uh, should he be selected. If you don't know, contract operators are independent contractors that would operate a program that the district would otherwise run. Uh, similar to a community service organization, but they're operating a single facility. Uh, so this person would be operating just a hockey program uh, for youth and adult. This could be anything from uh, adult expert legs to youth beginning uh, legs to clinics, um, teaching, teaching how to skate, um, as well as uh, many other uh, factors that he's brought to us. Um, Ventura, Ventura Roller Sports would not have exclusive use of the arena, uh, whereas BMX has exclusive use of the Freedom Bike Track, Mr. Poe would not have exclusive use of the hockey arena. We would still rent the arena um, on an as available basis. We would continue our relationship with the Ventura County Derby Darlings. Uh, they've been with us since 2007 uh, renting from us, and so that arrangement would not change. Um, like other contract operators, Ventura Roller Sports would follow the agreement um, that we have with the contract and would be responsible for rent and meeting certain uh, agreed upon goals. We set some criteria that would have to be met to show some success for the programs. Uh, Lenny, before you go on, could you go back one slide? I have a question about that. The second bulleted item, it says not have exclusive use of the arena, but be allowed to use the arena for youth and adult hockey leagues, camps, and tournaments. Would it also be available for open skating like it is now? Good question. Yes. So we are currently opening it in the morning. Those times would still be available for play in the morning on a weekday or on times that aren't already reserved. So if Adam has his program, we would have those hours and those days the rink, I don't want to say would be closed, but the rink would be um, available for his programs on Tuesdays and Thursdays and on Derby Bout days when the Ventura County Derby Darlings have their reservations, they would have the rink. However, the rink would be open during the day at times that it's not being used. Does that answer your question? That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Okay. Um, the term of this initial agreement is for six months. This will be uh, starting in December, and this is just that kind of that test period to see uh, if Mr. Poe can, in fact, get uh, some hockey going for adults, for children, for anything, something that looks like a program out there that is going to kind of be show the district and show staff that there is going to be some success. Um, we've kind of thrown the contract operators out there before, just kind of hoping that, you know, they'll make this work. For a variety of reasons or problems, they haven't maybe succeeded. We're going to work with Mr. Poe to make sure that you know he succeeds um, and provide him with a time period to, to get that done. Uh, meeting the criteria would be operating four nights 
on Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday for roller sports activities, um, and showing us that two successful ligs each week for the period of two sessions or two seasons uh, would be operational. If the criteria has not, or has been met, I'm sorry, has been met in the initial six months, the contract will extend for two years through May 31st, 2025. If the criteria has not been met in the initial six months, Mr. Poe can be granted another additional six months to meet the criteria. It's gonna take a little bit of time. If you kind of remember, anybody who's ever started up with youth sports, adult sports, it doesn't take off from the beginning. Like a plant, it needs to grow. It needs help. It needs to foster itself. So. Um, if upon the second probation, Mr. Poe meets the criteria, the contract will extend for one year. If upon the second probation, Mr. Poe fails to meet the criteria, we'll we will terminate the contract. Uh, some of the items outlined in the contract be keeping the arena clean, uh, and general upkeep. Uh, having the, the operator will have access to the two sheds that are there. Right now, it's currently filled with some old hockey stuff that he's more than welcome to use, but he'll clean it up and, and get that be. Uh, the operator will use the time between approval of agreement and November 30th to get the facility ready, advertise the program that's coming, and on December 1st, with approval of any changes. Um, as part of the contract, uh, the staff will work with Mr. Poe to provide programming and continue to offer rental time to the existing renters, Derby Darlins, I don't have any other renters at this time, but every now and then you get a phone call. Uh, the district will continue to rent out the hockey arena to other outside organizations on an available basis. And we'll continue to offer some open skate hours, um, as I had mentioned earlier. Um, and then the note operator may be getting outside the arena ready for programming. So he'll be getting the rink ready, uh, he'll be getting his advertising ready, phone number, website, you name it, to, to get this program up and running. Fiscal impact. So for the trial period, we are starting off with an $800 a month rent. Um, a utility monthly fee for $100 for the lights, and then 67% of the portable toilet fee. The uh, other 33% are gonna be shared by the Ventura County Derby Darlings. Um, so the total initial fee will be just over $1,000 per month. Um, if Mr. Poe doesn't meet the criteria of the initial trial period, the payment would remain the same for the possible extension of the six months. Everybody with me? <laughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Yes. Uh, the trial period meets criteria in year one. The proposed monthly fee will then increase to $900. So he's up and running. He's been successful after the six months. He's going to see an increase in programming. We're going to increase the rent $100. The utility monthly fee would be $100 through December of 2023 and then $120 in December of 2024. As lights are escalating, those costs would also rise. Uh, the 67% of the portable toilet fee uh, per month, and this is all kind of dependent on the charge from United Rentals that we have out there. If the trial period uh, meets criteria two, or criteria in year two, uh, we'll increase the rent to 954. That's a 6% increase. Uh, the utility, did I move this? Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, and then same with the six, lights would be at a 120, then 140 in December of 2024 until 2024. Did I get that right? <laughs> and then the 67% of the portable toilet fee. L Lanny? What, what is the rent for the utilities? It's 120 or 140? Good question. I think that's supposed to be 120 until 2025. Yeah, so, so it's 120 until December of 2024, and then it was 140 until December of 2025. Okay, Typo. thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Yep. Good catch. Uh, so revenue to the district if the initial trial period is passed. Uh, for six months, we're looking at just over $6,000. Um, and the revenue post-trial period one, uh, around $13,000, $13,500. And after period year two, uh, up to $14,000. Is that net, Lanny? What, what net? It'd be gross revenue. 
So there's still expenses. That, so what's the net? How much does the district actually make? Uh, good question, and that's where we're trying to get our hands on the, on the light fees are about $100, uh, give or take about 125 to $150 a month um, you know, that we pay and that we're getting from the rental from the v, uh, VC Derby Darlings and then from uh, Mr. Poe. Uh, the rental of the rink is the facility there uh, that we're making, but then that goes to, uh, he'll be there to upkeep the facility. So it, it's gross revenue is kind of how we, we look at it. I mean, as far as net, there'll be some other costs, but his cost would be offsetting those, if that helps. So the, the net to the district is, uh, using the broadest expression, would be somewhat under $14,000. I say that'd be fair. Okay, thank you. Lanny, um, are we gonna help him advertise? Are we, going to let, are we going to charge him for being in the guide, or are we going to advertise for him? Or we'll work with that, yes. We, can, we already have some, like, kind of like we have with the CSOs, we do have you know, kind of the 12th page ad, or we can work out some other you know, um, resident organization rates uh, for advertising, whether it's a half page, full page. We'll work with him on that. Um, he will be up on the website, and that there will be a link for Freedom Park Hockey, um, right. that it can get them started at least, you know, with his phone number and a website that can get it so that people at least know who to contact through us to get to him if needed. So, yeah, that's the goal. Well, I, I would hope that he succeeds because I think that's a great program. And I, I, I happen to know somebody who knows him from Burbank and uh, was very happy with his, uh, his work there. So... Uh, Director Dransel had her, had her hand up. Okay. Um, I this might be too soon to ask, but um, are they requesting? I mean, pending, you know, the success of the program, um, are they requesting to become considered a CSO? No, they would be a contract operator like BMX um, is where they are paying us the monthly rent. They are running their own business. They can be as successful as they want to be. Um, they don't need to have a, um, uh, a nonprofit status, so they would not be considered a CSO. Got it. Thanks. You have anything, Jordan? No. Um, I, uh, I think this is a heck of a challenge for the, for the operator, but he obviously knows a lot more about this than I do. Um, because, you know, I've, I've been around for the 18 years that we've owned it, and it's been a rough slog the whole way. Um, and I, and I, really hope, I really hope he's successful because, you know, one of, the, one of the ways we measure ourselves is the range of things we offer. You know, we, we, like, we like the things we have to be great and nice and safe and all that, but, but having a great range is, is also a plus. And we haven't had roller hockey for a while. I'd love to see him be successful. Um, to me, the, the, the success will make all those numbers irrelevant in a couple of years, and that, that's really what we want to point, point towards is being successful. And I'm also glad to hear that the, that the community will still have access to the rink yeah. because the more people to know that's out there, the more interest there's going to be in the, in the programs that take place there, yeah. both the Derby Darlings program and his program. So. Adam is going to be able to speak to this better than I am. Um, we are in a unique opportunity, and it's an opportunity because there's been a quite a few roller um, arenas in the area that have closed, didn't survive COVID or whatever reason. So we are one of the few roller hockey facilities around. So he will be able to draw from Santa Barbara um, into the valley and that kind of thing. I do have a lot of uh, information. I had Adam write me up. Uh, kind of some things that he succeeded with in both Burbank and in San Jose. It's lengthy, but he really hit his targets. He hit his budget. He had a budget of $147,000 a year, and he was consistently over $200,000. Uh, He's managed 45 plus employees. Um, he had 115 teams, um, I think before COVID, brought them all back after COVID, and then exceeded 115 and went over 200 teams um, you know, in the ice arena up at, up in San Jose. So 
he's had some success operating, if you will, and I can relate to this, running leagues. Um, you know, running in adult sports, running with youth sports, and, and making that succeed. So I think he's going to put his heart and soul into this. Um, but let me finish some slides, and then I will bring Mr. Poe up if you have any questions for him. I'm going to have a question for you, Lanny. So when go, you go ahead and proceed, and then we'll talk. Okay. Um, and then this matches our strategic plan compliance of uh, Plan Goal 3.1, uh, renovi renovating and modernizing existing facilities to provide a range of leisure programs to meet the needs of the community, and the recommendation to uh, that the board consider and approve the agreement between the district and the Ventura Roller Sports. I, ju I just have a few questions. Mm -hmm. uh, when Mr. Poe comes in, has he already examined the facility? I assume so. He, yes, yes, he has. Um, I met with him, where are we now, fall? I met with him last spring out there. We, Caitlin and I met with him a couple weeks ago, and he's actually been out there playing regularly on Wednesdays during our open time uh, with about 18 other individuals that are showing up and playing just before dark. So he's already generated some, some interest just by word of mouth. Um, let's say that um, Mr. Poe comes in and he starts conducting business or maybe just before he starts conducting business and he finds that there needs to be some improvements of the, like extra outlets, uh, things like that. Um, what is the, um, the agreement going to be and how those get done? He would have to use, kind of like I submitted in the uh, document, attachment H, I believe, is any facility upgrades he would need to provide to the district to stating what it is that he would want. Now, there are some other cosmetic things that the district can do and I would like to have done before he does get started. As an example, there's some netting on the uh, north and south ends that if, whether it's wind or whatever, is kind of pulled away from the poles. We, the district, I would like us to take care of that. Um, there's some other just little cosmetic things, whether it's just taking down some of the cobwebs on the dasher board, blowing out the sides. There are some, some items that the district I would like to, to, to put in um, to take care of. But if he wants a major overhaul or a facility thing, he's going to have to submit to staff uh, what these items are, and then we're going to have to work through that as to what. And there's going to be some things he's going to have to pay for, and there's some things that maybe we end up doing. What I'm getting at is that those things that are in between the lines, like for instance, we really need this electrical outlet here if there isn't one. And I've got one of the guys that skates here that can do that. He's pretty handy. I, I just want to avoid that kind of stuff. I totally agree with you. And that would be something if we need to go out, if we can't either do it in-house, we would have to go out and depending on the size of the, the job, get a bid, at least get some quotes and, and move forward. Okay. But yeah, I'm not going to let two guys. Oh, never mind. <laughs> um, I um, agree with Director Malloy uh, that this might be a tough nut to crack. Uh, however, reading the past, Mr. Po Poe's performance, it looks like if anybody can handle this, then he might be the guy to do it. Um, but. Since I've been here for a long time, and I've never seen a situation yet when there were multi-users of a facility that there weren't a lot of problems. Good question. And actually, upon approval of this, I have already talked to the Derby Darlings, and Jessica is here as well, the representative for the Derby Darlings, and Adam, and they both know that if this gets approved, we are sitting down and having a calendar meeting for 2023 <laughs> so that there are no confusions, that if there is a Saturday that... Uh, the derby bout is scheduled. There will not also be a hockey tournament. So we are laying down day by day who's going to have what. So, for example, Mr. Poe already knows that the derby darlings are going to be there on Tuesday and Thursday nights for practices. They don't go year-round, but they go, let's say, 10 months out of the year. Um, on the other hand, the derby darlings are going to know that he's going to be there on Monday and Wednesday night, Saturday morning, and Sunday afternoon, evening. Um, Yes, there could be some gray lines or if there's a switch in the Derby Darlin' bout, but it conflicts with Mr. Poe, we're not going to be able to honor that. On the other hand, if he's not doing anything on Saturday, morning, on Saturday afternoon 
and the, the rink is available, then yeah, we can move that. So yes, and I've done this for years and hopefully the, the CSOs can attest that I'm pretty good at a calendar meeting and knowing what, what's going on during the year. It's a little bit different situation between a CSO though and a contractor who's signed a contract with the district, right? It is, so long as his business plan has showed that he's going to be using four days. Um, and again, with the Derby Darlings and their existing schedule, again, we're gonna sit down with a calendar and nail down every day. Um, there are those one-offs, those one, oh God, I, I need whatever, and that's gonna be the conversation and all three parties are gonna have to sit down to, to work out. And so are you gonna use the same, um, well, are you gonna do it the same way you do with the CSOs and kind of make them figure it out for themselves and come to an agreement? Initially, yes. Um, obviously, if there needs to be a referee or something, I guess I step in. On the other hand, I think we can nail this down. With all the parties in the room and everybody's got their correct information in front of them, we should be able to walk out of that meeting with a, with a good time frame. Okay, now that you've gone on the record with that, um, what happens if Mr. Poe is as successful as he already has been? Mm -hmm. And now he needs more time and more space. More space is going to be a little tough. I don't have more space. More well, I'm in mo more space uh, than he w that was available to him than he had before. Good. And then that would be another sit-down conversation with the Derby Darnold. The first thing I would do is offer Friday nights. Friday nights at this time aren't being – how do I say this? They're not being, they're not being proposed by uh, Mr. Poe as of yet. Again, success hopefully can breed that. On the other hand, the Derby Darlings do use Fridays for Derby Bout setup. They use a couple hours uh, those nights just to set up for the Derby Bout the next day. So we will have to work out some of those issues. Um, if for some reason, I would also push them to other, like Sundays, if weekends, and, and I don't know, I'm not a hockey parent, but I've, I know some people that will go great lengths to go get their kid to the hockey. If we can extend Sunday, we will. The Derby Darlings aren't using every Saturday. So he could also extend on Saturday. So we can go at it that way. Again, there's a available time for everybody at the rink. There are only 27, 24 hours in a day. But again, you know, if success breeds, one, I'll be very happy. Two, we will have a conversation with all the interested parties. Yes, I, I hope from my questions that the parties understand that, um, and I can tell from your presentation, you've already contemplated some of these things. Um, that everyone should be um, willing to compromise and everyone get along uh, so that we don't end up with some of the situations that we've had in the past when we've had competing um, groups uh, fighting over the same space. Um, and with that, I just want to say that your initial um, presentation was as clean and sharp as I've seen. Thank you. Any, anything else from anyone? No. You ready? Yes. Okay. I'll make a motion to uh, approve the agreement between the district and Ventura Roller Sports. Second. Director Magner. Aye. Director Dransfeld. Aye. Director Roberts? Aye. Director Malloy? Aye. Chair Kelly? Aye. B, consideration and approval of resolution number 721, adopting district special event policy. Good evening, Chair Kelly, Board of Directors. Uh, my name is Macy, I'm the supervisor, and I will be presenting uh, for consideration and hopefully approval of Resolution 721, adopting a special event policy. So as you guys know, the district is uh, partially in business of doing special events. Internally, we have 50 Plus Expo, Easter Extravaganza, Halloween, Christmas Parade, Summer Concert Series. Uh, so those are all district-run special events. We do also help manage external 
uh, special events. So those would be things like our Holly Jolly Half Marathon, 5K runs, uh, filming, um, and then other special events that come in through the district. So things that you typically see in those external events, we go, we gather the information, we need to know what day is your event, how many people are coming, what are the expectations, uh, et cetera. So we started meeting with policy community back in August of 21. We brought drafts of this policy in February, April, and June. And this policy relates only to external reservations. So this would not apply to any of the internal district events, 50 plus Easter, Halloween. So when we brought this to the committee, things we asked, why do we need it? Um, what are the requirements for event manager? What is the process for booking food vendors? Um, are there external entities that we have to go through? The city of Camarillo, the county of Ventura, uh, Ventura Fire. Um, so those are all things that were asked in, um, in the staff report. We have, I think, 12 or 15 different questions that were asked and answered. Um, so all of these um, were addressed and um, led to the creation of this policy. So there are five parts to this policy. The first one is special event qualifications. So what actually is a special event and what makes it different from a facility reservation, a picnic pavilion, a 25 person birthday party? Um, what, is, what are those differences? Um, so we go through the information gathering, all of the elements of the requested event, the reservation, who's involved, um, is it an organization? Is it just a mom throwing a party? Um, and are there any food trucks? Are there any inflatables? Is there alcohol? Are there high-risk activities being performed? What is the event being requested? If there is anything with an attendance level over a certain amount, that may require board approval. Um, if there are four more event context elements, then it would be deemed a special event. So there are things that trigger board approval. If the event has more than 500 attendees, if the events are ticketed or charging admission, if there is use of a sports field for events other than sports, if the events uh, could cause potential facility or turf damage, if it is a multi-day event, um, and there are exceptions. So exceptions would be things like weddings. Weddings may have more than 300 people. There may be things like Viva La Comida, things that are already grandfathered in. We know they run well, um, and we know they know how to handle their event. So there are things that wouldn't have to come to the board. Um, however, if something happens at one of those events, say um, there's an incident or a violation from this policy, then that would trigger the special event to be reevaluated and potentially have a staff member on site for the next year's event. So part two um, of the policy is just a broad overview of the process that we as staff go through to book a special event. Um, it outlines uh, required documents and the priority for reservations, and then a separate working document outlines the full and in-depth special event process. So that's also attached. Part three is violations. So what, what steps would the district take if a uh, party was to violate the policy? Um, part four is cancellations and part five is appeal appeals. All of these follow our ordinance eight and our general use policy. So as mentioned, attach attachment two in this is our special event process and attachment three is the permit application. Just a reminder that this is a working document um, but it does go over, again, the qualification, what is a special event versus what is a rental, um, contact and event information, our district waiver, and a credit card form. So at this time, there is no fiscal impact, although cost savings may be calculated with staff time by streamlining processes and reducing questions back and forth between staff and the um, customer. Staff time used to prepare this policy and report presentation, and then potential of staff cost recovery for events. This meets strategic plan goals 1.1b, develop sustainable funding sources 
for implementation of the strategic plan, deferred maintenance, priority projects, and ongoing operations, and 1.3E, regularly evaluate whether the district is capturing adequate revenue through facilities and program usage, seeking new and enhanced revenue generating facilities, special events, and programs. So it is recommended the Board of Directors review and approve Resolution 721, adopting a special event policy. And at this time, if you have any questions or discussion that I can answer or address. Well, I know we had talked about this for a long time. I didn't realize until you actually annotated the meetings um, how long it had taken because there, re there, really is, there really is a big difference between the kind of big special events that we were working on and renting a picnic table. Um, so there were a lot of so there were a lot of questions to work through, and staff had to go back and forth uh, with us quite a few times before before we got to the finish. But um, it's you know we we had a group come to us and wanted to put up a big special event, and we really had no real process in place to figure out how, we'd a, how, how that would actually work because we'd never done anything, anything significant like that other than on our own. So we wanted to make sure we, we came up with answers that made sense for them and made sense for the district and made sure everybody ended up happy with the process. So um, that, that's, why this, that's why this was created. But the, the, uh, the notion of special events, when I started at this job 16 years ago, there was, there was almost none, and it was really small, and, and now special events are like a big part of our life. I'm, I'm always amazed at how much social media coverage and how much attention special events get in a lot of communities. And we have a lot of, we have a lot of different facilities that, that could work out well for this, so uh, now, we have, now we have a process to not have to have the staff run to Mary and Mary figure out what the right answer is and, and um, maybe not that not get consistently related to the applicant from one time to another. And you know, now, now we have it all in writing and make, makes a lot more sense. Um, but I really wanna thank the rec staff and, and Karen especially for all her input on this to help, help make it make sense because it, it, it all has to work smoothly or you end up with a lot of unhappy people. And I think Karen can attest to this too, is sometimes the customer comes to us and they don't know that they want a special event. They don't know that their event is going to evolve into this. Yeah. And so laying it all out, they're gonna see, okay, oh, I am gonna invite all these people. Oh, now I'm gonna have a face painter. I am gonna have food vendors. Yeah, I'm gonna have alcohol. We probably need security. And they see all these things on paper and they think, now now they can read, oh, this is a special event. And now we know the processes and the, the right people to go to. Um, for their permitting and, and to make sure everything is safe for everyone that's attending the special events. Macy, um, the big events that we have on an annual basis, like the Greek festival, which has way more than 500, um, are, is the board gonna have to approve that every year or is that gonna be something that we can grandfather in and? Uh... Correct, yeah, so that's kind of what I was hitting on earlier. So that would already be a grandfathered event. They've been doing it year after year after year. Now, if something happened, if there was a big incident, if, um, yeah, if, if they violated this policy in any way, we would have to bring that back for review and then the next year that they tried to bring it back, we would say, I'm sorry, at this point now, you need to pay for staff. Staff need to be on site to make sure your event is running smoothly, there aren't any violations, and you're adhering to the policies that we've put in place. So at this time, yes, there are events that will be grandfathered in. Okay, so you and Caitlin and Mary and, and uh, Karen will all know who, who's, who's gonna be grandfathered in so that... And that's not to say that even if they're grandfathered in, that we won't still check on them. That's well, not I was saying just that we won't say, go. Are, we, are, are they still going to fill out the documents so yes. that we know? Yes, they'll still. And they know what the requirements yes, are? They'll still go through the exact same process. We just wouldn't bring it to you. Okay. Now, part of this policy, too, is if there is something that has to come to the board, they now need to submit it at least 90 days in advance. So that needs, it needs to give us time to come to you and say, can this event happen? Yes or no? Thank you. My question was along those lines. Is there a list of grandfathered special events that you have or, or that you could uh, send to us? It's, yeah, it's not in the policy, but we, we can come in. Okay, yeah. thank you. 
I was on the committee that uh, went through all this, and it was a daunting task, but it looks like we have a completed pro product, and it looks pretty good. I don't have my good glasses. Bev. Oh, sorry, Bev. No worries. Um, I, from when I was working there, I remember working on this. <laughs> um, so it's just really great to see um, staff come together and be able to present something. Uh, it's, it's really beautiful. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I just want to say congratulations to them for having something because I know um, how how difficult it can be to navigate some of these events um, and to have something to actually reference and have be concrete, which I think has been echoed by many directors. Um, I, the question that I was going to ask Director Roberts asked um, in regards to exactly who would be grandfathered in, I think that would just help provide clarity um, for, for those vendors um, or, and also just for the board. So um, yeah, if we could get that, that would be awesome. Sure thing. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Director Drensfeld. Aye. Director Roberts. Aye. Director Magner. Aye. Director Malloy. Aye. Chair Kelly. Aye. Thank you. Consideration of opening new investment account with California Class for holding Quimby Capital and Contingency Funds. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah great. Thank you. This is Bob Schull with California Class and Public Trust Advisors. Great to be with you tonight. Uh, hope to be able to be there in person at a board meeting uh, down the road. But I just wanted to take maybe five minutes or so to uh, overview California class uh, and the local government investment pool that Public Trust Advisors is the investment manager and administrator on. Um, one of the questions with this pool is, you know, why a new pool in California? Uh, and really probably two reasons first and foremost. Um, secondly, across public agencies in the state, there's been some demand for some time for another investment option for a local government investment pool. There's two other options in the marketplace currently, and there was a sense that there needed to be more, more options, more um, opportunity to diversify. So that was probably issue uh, 1A. And then 1B was to also be able to offer perhaps a more improved customer service or client service experience to participants in these pools. And I'll talk about that in just one second. Uh, the pool was launched in June. Public Trust Advisors, who I work for, uh, is the investment manager and administrator, as I mentioned. This is Public Trust's 18th local government investment pool around the country. And collected, collectively, excuse me, we manage uh, about $62 billion in assets across those pools. In addition to short duration pools, sometimes called a liquidity pool, we also manage about $3 billion across the state of California in separately managed accounts, whereby we might have an agency that's able to go further out on the yield curve, whether that's three years, four years, five years, and we can build a custom uh, portfolio, custom account known as a separately managed account for that agency. Um, when the pool was launched in June, we were very fortunate in two ways. One was that we had the full endorsement of the CSDA, the California Special Districts Association, 
as well as the League of California Cities, uh, who are both endorsers of the product. Uh, the, the part of the pool, there's actually two investment options within the pool. The, 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 the option that is the most popular currently is the short duration uh, liquid option. Looks just like a government money market fund. It has a stable net asset value. You go in a, do in a dollar and you exit at a dollar. That net asset value doesn't move. What fluctuates is the yield. And you know sometimes it's better to be lucky than good as the old saying. And we were fortunate in launching the pool in June that we've been able to take advantage of this pretty dramatic rise in interest rates coming from the Fed over the last four months. And as you may know, we had a 75 basis point increase 10 days ago and probably looking at another 75 basis points sometime between now and the end of the year. Uh, the prime option, as it is known, is fully liquid. There's no minimum transaction amount at all. There are no fees on our side uh, as the administrator. The only fees that a participant might encounter would be for a wire fee from a bank. Most transactions are done via ACH. Um, it is, uh, or it has received the highest ranking possible from Standard & Poor's, a AAA rating from Standard & Poor's, and actually also Fitch and Moody's. To give you an idea of how transparent we build these portfolios, and as you may know within California, it's gotta be all treasuries and AAA rated commercial paper, but we actually uh, send the portfolio every day of the week to Standard & Poor's for the uh, the most current rating you could possibly have for a product like this. So a lot of transparency around what we do there. Uh, there is another option in the pool that we're not uh, discussing that much today with the current interest rate environment. It's a medium term option. So if a agency, if a district, if a county, if a city in the state has capital, they can put away for whether it's eight years, um, excuse me, eight years, eight months, a year to a year and a half. Uh, is called the enhanced cash option within the pool. The difference is that the enhanced cash option is not a stable net asset value product. That net asset value can change and move in the marketplace. Uh, the yield could be greater as you're going further out on the yield curve, but that net asset value can change. And as you might know, there's an inverse relationship between interest rates and the price of fixed income securities. Uh, one of the advantages we have starting um, the pool in June, it does have a very short duration strategy. The weighted average on the pool right now is 33 days. So essentially every month these securities are rolling off and we're able to reinvest at higher and higher rates. Now, when rates stabilize, when rates pull back, you'll probably see participants move from the prime fund, the, the liquid money market fund, perhaps into an enhanced cash type strategy. Uh, but that's a quick overview. Uh, had a couple of meetings with the district, one initially back in July, and then a meeting with um, the finance committee, I guess that was two weeks ago, and certainly appreciate the time to uh, present to the board. Sorry that I'm not there in person, but again, hope to join all of you at some point down the road. So that's a quick overview of California class. Thank you, Bob. So we had Bob uh, Skype in, who, um, as he said, he un unfortunately couldn't join. And then uh, my name's Justin, I'm the Administrative Services Manager. Um, and so um, I'll just go through a, a quick presentation as well um, for the board. Um, so just a, a quick summary, um, after we've heard a kind of broad overview of what California class is, um, a reason why we might be looking um, towards opening an account there. Um, so currently, Pleasant Valley Recreation and Park District receives lump sums when housing developments do not include a park dedication or Quimby fees. Um, uh, currently, these funds are invested along with other uh, funds, uh, contingency and capital, and various uh, investments account totaling over $12 million uh, in cash as of August 31st. Um, California class would provide a greater return on investment and allow for some more liquidity with those funds. Um, so in 2021, the board approved an updated investment policy, uh, and this part of this policy is that we are providing the highest rate of return on our cash that we're holding with the minimal risk and having that quick liquidity 
um, where we're not investing money and then we can't use it. And now it's better if we just never invested it. Uh, currently, our funds are invested in either the Pacific Western Bank, uh, Ventura County Investment Pool, known as the VC Pool, and the California State Local Agency Investment Fund, also known as a LEAF. So um, for the month of August, rates for the current accounts were 1.6% in the VC Pool, 1.28% in LEAF, and 0.04% uh, in Pacific Western Bank, just a standard savings account um, there. So um, California Cooperative Liquid Asset Security System, the full name for California class, is a joint exercise of powers entity, which is authorized under the California Government Code Section 6509.7. Uh, California class operates on the requirements of California Code 53601, which provides strict regulations on the type of investment. So they're held to a, a very high standard these are not high risk junk bonds. They are not trying to make the quickest buck. They are very scrutinized by uh, state regulation. Um, so as Bob mentioned, they began offering services in July of this year. And for the month of August, California class saw a 1.75% rate of return. Um, so the following in this is a list of current California class participants. A um, couple ones of note, um, there is the North Humboldt Recreation and Park District. So we do have a, a Recreation and Park District that is currently investing, so we do know it's a, a appropriate investment for us. Uh, CSDA, the California Special Districts Association, is also have an account there. Um, I think it's a not unwise idea to kind of mirror some of their investments it, it, to an extent. Um, so California class would, depending on which account you're comparing it to, would allow us to increase our rate of return by about uh, 0.15 to 1.71% percentage points. So if we go compared to Pacific Western Bank, which is 0.04, we're increasing by 1.71%. Um, California class currently charges 0.06% uh, in administrative fees. VC Pool and LAFE are currently charging 0.05%. So it's a very small increase in charge for a fairly substantial increase in return. Uh, another benefit of California class is it allows for multiple sub accounts, which is something we can't do now except for Pacific Western. Uh, so with the VC pool and LAIF, we can only have one account of money. Uh, the problem with that is when we have Quimby, contingency capital, which are bigger pots of money, it is a best practice that account, uh, auditors like to see that you do not commingle your um, restricted and semi-restricted funds into the same investment account, uh, just as a way to make sure you're keeping them uh, separate on your books. So by having multiple sub-accounts, we can move a lot of the money that we have in Pacific Western and kind of combine that with some of our Quimby money and keep it separate so we have that flexibility to um, put more funds into the higher returning account. Um, also, California class provides an additional hour for same day transfers compared to LAFE, where LAFE requires us to initiate a transfer by 10. Uh, VC, or California class allows us to initiate by 11 Pacific. So it gives us that extra hour, which could be crucial if we realize we're and again, hopefully the situation never comes up, but if we realize there's an emergency, we need a, you know 500,000 at 1030, as it is now, we would have to wait at least a day. With California class, we'd have that extra hour. Uh, VC pool requires a couple of days because they require us to sign and submit a wire transfer. And so this chart here, using our August values of cash and the investment rate shows what our returns were um, for our different accounts. So of the just about 12.5 million invested, we had a return of uh, 9,844 9, and four cents. And again, when we're dealing with this, we're assuming uh, cash accounts and investment rates stay the same. Obviously that's not realistic, but it does allow us to do kind of an apples to apples comparison. Um, so on the next slide here, if we had California class, and we invested about 40% of our, our funds in there, um, we would have the same 12.5 million, but our monthly interest goes up to 16,268.99, um, just by adding this one account and consolidating some of our funds. 
Uh, so that would be an additional throughout the year, $77,099.40. So it's a, a, a real simple way for us to kind of bring in a bit more revenue to the district with having this cash that we're already just holding. Most of that is getting the money out of our Pacific West. We've, right now we have 4.8. Uh, we move a majority of that into the California class. And the reason we don't move it into LAFE or VC pool is again, we've got to keep our Quimby and our semi-restricted capital and our contingency separate as a best practice. Um, so opening this investment account uh, would meet our strategic plan goal 1.2, utilize best accounting practices and forecast and optimize revenue while controlling expenditures. And strategy 1.3, identify additional sources of revenue to reduce the reliance of property tax. So it is our recommendation today that we, uh, the board approve the opening of a California class account to hold contingency, Quimby, and other funds as necessary. And we are not set on the 40%, we can invest as much or as, as little as the board finds prudent. And any questions? Bob, it's Elaine Magner. Um, Hello. Hi. Uh, you, you mentioned the 75 uh, basis points that perhaps the feds would, uh, might be raising the, the rates. How quick is the turnaround that uh, California class would be uh, applying that to uh, our funds? Yeah, it's a really good question. What we're seeing right now is a two to three week lag as far as an uptick in the rate with the pool. To give an example, uh, the current rate as of this morning is 3.1%. It's gone up significantly here in the last two months. But just this last uh, increase from the Fed, we've seen a corresponding increase again, over the last couple of weeks to the point where today, that's where the rate is currently 3.1%. So lags to the Fed a bit, um, but it's it's fairly quick, that impact. And, and when, okay, is that um, calculated daily, monthly, or how is that calculated on our balance? Yeah, it's calculated daily and compounded daily as well. So it's a very liquid, uh, daily compounding type strategy for really short-term cash management for public agencies. Thank you. Sure. Um, don't we have a limitation as to the amount we can have in any one place? Isn't it like one third? I, uh, it's about 40%. Yeah, 40%. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And that's, and that's one of our problems too currently It's because we can't put too much in one place and we only have two places that offer decent interest rates, and the third one is, as you can see, virtually non-existent interest. So that's why the increase is so great, and because they're new and their stuff is so fresh and the rates are growing up, or it's, it's going to march up a lot faster than VC Pool is yeah, going to do or lathe. Yeah, that is exactly correct, and again, one of the benefits of launching the pool mid-June in this environment. Justin actually proposed a much more aggressive schedule, <laughs> but uh, Director Roberts very wisely suggested a slightly more prudent plan, uh, which is what, what's in the proposal here. So, but it still make a really substantial increase. And that uh, being able to have multiple funds is also gonna simplify his job a lot too, because that, that's one of the real limitations. Not the because, only reason we're doing it though. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, well, it's, it, 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 make, it makes sense, but it also, you know, reading our cash report is sort of is sort of complex, and um, that's this, you know, this, having more good options is going to make that simpler. So. And just one thing I wanted to point out was that uh, the one point seven five percent that you saw up there is net of fees. So we talked a little bit about the fees and. Um, <laughs> You know, how much they were, and I appreciate you showing that it was, you know, uh, the rates up there. So it is actively managed, from what I understand, versus our other accounts. Is that correct? It's it's more actively managed, yes. So Which is why they're able to capture a bigger return? Yeah, so I think um, you know it's it's actively managed, and um, the the cost to do that is uh, you know bargain uh, compared to the you know with relation to the net fee that we get or the net. Uh, increase in percentage return. So appreciate the 
opportunity that you guys brought forward to us, and that's it. Oh. I'm sorry, Bev. I keep forgetting you're there on the phone. <laughs> no worries. I, no questions at this time. Thank you. Okay. Motion, please. Motion to approve recommended action with 40% uh, going to class. And I'll second it. Director Roberts? Aye. Director Magner? Aye. Director Dransfeld? Aye. Director Malloy? Aye. Chair Kelly? Aye. Consideration and adoption of resolution number 724 nominating a board member to fill the term of 1 1 2023 to 12 31 2026 for the regular or alternate special district member of the Ventura County Local Agency Formation Commission better known, I believe, as LAFCO. Who's, who's doing the present? Oh, you are? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, good evening again, directors. I will be presenting um, <clears throat> this night uh, agenda item. Uh, the summary of the uh, presentation is the term of the Ventura, Ventura Local Agency Formation Commission, also known as LAFCO, is a special, di uh, special district regular member Elaine Friedman and alternate member John Curtis will expire on December 31st, 2022. As such, an appointment for each seat must be made for the next four-year term beginning January 1st, 2023, going through December 31st, 2026. Uh, LAFCO is an independent agency created by the state of California responsible for reviewing and approving proposed jurisdictional uh, boundary changes. LAFCO is seeking an individual to serve in the capacity of the special district's regular member or alternate to fill the four-year term ending in uh, December 31st, 2026. The alternate member only serves in the absence of the regular member. Uh, LAFCO special district members are appointed by the Independent Special Districts Selection Committee, which consists of the presiding, uh, presiding officers of the legislative bodies of each independent special district in the county. If the district wishes to nominate an individual to be a candidate for either the regular member or, or the alternate member in, in LAFCO, LAFCO requires the district to submit a nominating resolution and a candidate statement or resume of no more than one page by, by October 14th. There is no uh, anticipated fiscal impact uh, to this recommendation. This does meet one of our strategic plan compliances, uh, develop, maintain, and uh, enhance relationship with other government agencies uh, serving the community. So the recommendation tonight is to consider and adopt uh, a resolution number 724, nominating uh, a board member for the election of the uh, uh, Ventura LAFCO special district's regular member or special district's alternative member, um, alternate member for the term beginning January 1st, 2023 through December 31st, 2026. So tonight, if any of the board members would like to uh, be nominated, this is where you do it. Please stand up if you wish to be nominated. Well, last night at the Ventura County Special Districts Association meeting, there were actually two people who stood up and who are running for uh, Elaine Freeman's spot, the right. permanent spot. There is nobody that, as of yet uh, that is running for the alternate spot. And typically when you take the alternate spot, you move up to the permanent spot when the alternate spot person is, is done. So um, there's a good training opportunity there for anybody uh, that might want to might want to get involved in LAFCO and seeing how the formation of government in Ventura County happens. Maybe some of the younger members of the board would like to step up. <laughs> yeah, I was looking. I was looking at one of them. 
<laughs> I, I was looking at you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't look at me, man. Where's, where's that phone that Bev's on? Yeah. <laughs> Bev, now um, I remember you're there. <laughs> I, can, I can do alternate. Okay. Excellent. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll make a motion that we nominate Bev for the alternates. And I'll second it. Director Magner? Aye. Director Malloy? Aye. Director Dransfeld? Aye. Director Roberts? Aye. Chair Kelly? Aye. Let the campaign begin. Yep. <laughs> this is the time for oral communication. Looks like um, I'm first. I don't have much to say tonight. Uh, but what I would That'll like to day. say is um, we're in the 10th month now. And uh, I think that this board has operated famously. Um, we've got a lot of work done. We've performed our duties. Everybody stepped up. People, even when they're sick, they would find a way to attend the meeting and ha have their say and participate. And I personally think that there is no better operating board anywhere than this particular board. Um, it's, it's just a credit to, to government when you see something work so well. Uh, other, I just like a, a, a few comments. These are kind of a little bit off the cuff. And that is, I've been noticing for a while now how COVID has kind of changed things. And I don't think that there's any aspect of our lives that uh, hasn't changed. I know that my own profession um, has changed immensely. We almost do nothing anymore. It's law for anyone that doesn't know. But we almost do nothing face-to-face uh, -face anymore. In fact, there's some people who won't even do it. I have court reporters who they're, they're not going to come to your office and sit for a deposition anymore. They will only do a Zoom deposition, which is what, I haven't done an in-person deposition in two years. Um, all the court calls, except for trials, are not in person. Uh, all meetings among organizations now are mostly Zoom. Um, people, I, I mean, I have some people close to me that do this, but I won't mention their names. Uh, they, instead of going out to dinner, they order food to come to their house. There's now a whole industry that provides food to your house so you don't have to go out. And I've often wondered why, what has happened? Um, but I think you know, a reasonable people could agree that it's probably, at least in some part, because of COVID and having gotten used to, you know, such behavior. Um, frankly, I would like to see people get out a little bit more than they have. Uh, this is, for instance, election time, but I've taken note of people that no longer want to participate in things. And I think that we have to get back. And maybe it's that one little step. You go out for dinner when it would be easier to go get it. Or, I mean, if you look at Yolanda's, they have a whole business now of, um, of takeout. They never had that before. And I even find myself, oh, t takeout's easier. Just run by, swing by, and get it. They're all ready for you when you get there. You can even, I don't do this, of course, but you can even order drinks to go and so forth for those that do. But um, it's, it's just amazing. And I just thought I would point, point it out and see if anyone else, you know, uh, has has noticed it and I get calls and emails and so forth from people and so this is a subject I'm throwing out there for those who who do contact me is how can we kind of circle back and maybe um, not 
go the way of isolation and uh, kind of like being afraid of what might happen. Now, well, on the other hand, darn it if I haven't had people around me uh, get COVID in the last week or so. I thought we were done. In fact, I thought it was declared it was over. And I guess it's, I guess it's not because three people in my s circle is, that's a lot because I pretty much, I'm not out that much. And to have three people that I know get it, I guess it's back again. And I don't know if it's ever going to go away. And so asking people to step out at a time when uh, it's, it's still lingering out there, I guess maybe people will think I'm crazy or something. Um, but I, I just don't think it's good, and I just wanted to say that publicly. Thank you. S Special District Association. Okay. Um, Jordan and um, Director Malloy and I and uh, General Manager uh, Otten attended the uh, Ventura County Special District's bi-monthly uh, meeting last night. Um, we um, had a guest speaker, the uh, assistant county uh, clerk recorder, and she's also the Ventura County clerk recorder elect, um, Michelle Askerson. Um, she presented uh, what to expect for the November 2022 general election candidacy votes and canvas. And uh, she answered, uh, she was very well prepared and she answered some very good questions and uh, was nice having her uh, in person. Uh, she actually was there um, and uh, that was a nice thing. And as uh, Director Malloy mentioned, we had two speakers for the uh, LAFCO position and then I think there was one or two other ones that somebody indicated that they were interested. So, but two of them actually spoke. Um, just two really, or three really quick things on uh, California Special Districts Association. Um, the um, governor has now um, made his final decisions on vetoing and uh, signing the bills. Uh, one of the things that uh, CSDA was uh, opposed to, uh, he vetoed it, and that was the mandate on uh, websites. Um, and it would have been extremely costly for uh, special districts to, if he had assigned this. So, and he did not sign it, he did veto it. Um, <clears throat> on the national front, um, the National Coalition of Special Districts um, met with the um, key legislators representing the coalition's member states, uh, including um, bipartisan House and Senate uh, offices, of the seven uh, states that belong to the National Coalition. And the top priority for special districts advocates uh, was to uh, spotlight the necessity of uh, special districts to be clearly defined as eligible for federal programs, aiding local government infrastructure and uh, other community programs. Um, the uh, National uh, Coalition members elevated efforts to uh, request through the key congressional representatives an official nonpartisan congressional research service report to provide full context on issues surrounding special districts, uniform uh, access to federal programs geared toward local governments. And I think you'll all remember that during the, the several bills that went through Congress, we were completely left out. Counties and cities and states got money, but uh, special districts did not. So um, I think we're making a headway into this um, that we've got actually, uh, I think there were 15 uh, uh, different uh, congressional uh, offices uh, that were uh, represented there uh, from the, these states. And uh, I was very happy to see who was there and that it was bipartisan. So I think that's the important thing is we can't let it be Democrat or Republican. It's got to be bipartisan so that 
special districts get uh, the uh, recognition that they need so that we can have money for the infrastructure and things. So, because um, they expect us to do all this, but they don't give us any money. So, but I don't need to say that anymore. I know we all know that. So, but that's it. Uh, so CSDA is busy. Uh, we're uh, meeting in two weeks to decide what our uh, priorities will be for the legislation, uh, state legislation coming up uh, for 2023. So we're moving forward. Oversight. Um, since we don't, since we didn't have a report uh, submitted by Mike Mish, oh, we do have a report? Elaine's got the report. No, you didn't read it. Oh, it's it's in there. Here. <clears throat> um, okay. Oh, okay. It was in last night. Yeah, right. Yeah. I wasn't there physically, so I didn't get it. Right. In the paper. Now so, you have right. it. Okay. So, um, and of course, uh, I'm not at all familiar with this chart, so so uh, we're winging it. But basically, um, City of Camarillo is now. Uh, got its final payment scheduled for 9-2041. So um, their, their uh, redevelopment agency is inactive and is on its way out. And several, several other agencies um, are making progress to that effect. And it looks like the county has been successful getting the cities to actually justify the charges that they're making and making sure the charges are reasonable, whereas prior to this Oversight board being fined, f founded several of the cities just took the maximum amount they could and, and ran it right on through. But um, some of them are some of them are quite a bit uh, farther. For, for example, Fillmore Fillmore will be done in 2031, uh, Oxnard in 2038, uh, Wyneme next year, uh, 2023, um, and Santa Paula, Simi Valley, Thousand Oaks uh, are all uh, scheduled. Uh, the next through the next decade but the, the numbers are coming down and this is out of this is out of business and you may have more on this but I know there was some talk about restarting redevelopment and I think the governor put the absolute kibosh to that it's like this doesn't want to head down into this mess again so I don't think there's going to be another wave of redevelopment coming mark uh, I, th I think this is a very significant is issue because it costs us money that we never even see. It comes, uh, it comes off the top of our, uh, what we're supposed to get uh, before we even get it. Uh, could, just for the record, could you state as briefly as possible how it came to pass that the park district became liable for redevelopment debt? Well, it's actually all special districts became liable. Uh, I understand, but I mean just Allegedly, we benefit just us. from this. We're supposed yeah. to it. Yeah. Allegedly, we benefit from redevelopment because there's more property taxes being paid. But our actually cut of the exposure makes the payback on that like forever out there. For example, the hotels project, um, the amount of additional property tax we'll get, even though that hotels project will be worth a lot of money, it'll take us till 2045 to break even on that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, the, you know, the golden rule, who has the gold makes the rules, and then the cities pretty much drive this process, and it's structured so that it benefits them. In uh, the case of Thousand Oaks, for example, Thousand Oaks reimburses Caneo Rec and Park for all of their contributions to redevelopment. So there's actually no cash impact on Caneo because the city does that. City of Camarillo doesn't do that. And of course, that cuts into our budget and our ability to do things. Well, our budget, Camarillo Healthcare District's budget, you know, every, every, all special districts. Yeah, I understand it's everyone, but I'm kind of only interested in ours. Yeah. Well, uh, we're not being picked on individually. We just, no, I don't think we're being picked on. It's we're just, just we're just standing in the way of how the of how the ball game works. Yeah. So. Well, thank you. But for it's, it stopped, and and uh, there's not going to be more of that. So. Thank you for uh, explaining that on the record. Director Dransel would like to speak. Oh, certainly. Uh, I just have a question. Um, Director Malloy, has the um, city been approached about reimbursing the district? Um, if you mean, if, if whining out loud counts as approaching, uh, yes, many times. 
but um, it's just not. But, but no, I mean not like a formal just, request. Not, not not something they've chosen to do. They're aware of how the process works and how it disadvantages us. Um, when we signed off on the hotel project, um, direct uh, Mike Mishler, who was the director at the time, he was very opposed to the project because of the impact this would have on us, and because we'd see very we'd see very little return. We'd see no return on our money for, you know, two decades. Uh, or longer, and um, in the meantime, the city would be getting the bed tax, 100% of the bed tax at those hotels, the big, you know, the sales tax, which we don't see any share of, you know, it would have a much bigger impact, uh, positive for them than it was for us, but um, that, is, that, isn't, that isn't how the process has worked, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad we had this discussion, because I think the public needs to know about it. Uh, Santa Monica. So our Santa Monica meeting um, took place on Monday, September 19th. Um, the next one will be Monday, October 18th. Um, right now what they've been doing is they've been going through um, presentations of various uh, land acquisitions and um, there's a presentation on some restoration programs. And so they um, provided some resources which um, I'm actually gonna pass along to Kayleen and Parks. I think we may have been in touch with one of the organizations already that helped out with um, our Neil Ranch, but I just wanna make sure it isn't a different one. So I'll get that information over to them. And that's it. Thank you, Bev. Standing committees, finance? Um. Yes, uh, last month, because we ran so late, um, we sort of rushed things, so I didn't really give to get the full end, the year-end report from the previous month. Um, our full year 21-22 uh, Fund 10 revenues went up from 8.7 million to 9.3 million, which is an increase of $600,000. You know, that's well above the uh, projected increased revenues that our, our uh, fee study consultant has projected, and if you look at previous years, uh, a similar pattern uh, is exhibited. So, you know, our, our year to year increase is considerably more than 2% than a year in revenues. Um, our cash on uh, August 31st, as, as just mentioned in his presentation, was 15 million, uh, 473,000, and that is 3.3 million above the previous year to date, and a, historically a huge number for us. So um, it's great to have lots of cash when interest rates are going up. So um, this year, uh, interest income will be uh, will really sig significant for us, where it hasn't been the last couple of years. Um, in the first two months of fiscal 22-23, um, our public fees are up 105,000, and rentals are up 13,000 versus the previous year, as we're getting more and more activities and more and more people using uh, facilities. We've also started getting rebates uh, through Metropolitan for our turf removal projects. And we've got year to date, we've got 152,000 rebates. So those rebates are starting to fund the next round of turf removal projects. And also, um, uh, in a really long-term wonderful thing to have happen is we paid off a big loan, our pension uh, obligation loan, which we incurred the obligation in 2007 when we increased the the uh, pension plan for our employees, and um, we paid we paid a seven percent note to Calpers for a few years, and we refinanced it with the bank and got a lower interest rate, and we just made the final payment of one hundred and thirty-two thousand, and um, that loan is now retired. So, um, of course, Calpers has got their hand open, waiting with more unfunded liability year after year. So we won't be able to keep keep that for very long. But you know, yeah, we but, you paid that one off. We got another one for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in fact, we're going to have a report uh, in the next month or two from CalPERS and where we are in, on all our pension obligation loans. Uh, Jordan, do you have anything? Nope. Uh, the only other thing we brought forward tonight and passed was the yeah. uh, investment, so yeah. that's it. I think I remember si uh, uh, voting on that particular uh, subject you just brought up a long time ago, and now it's retired, and I'm still here, huh? <laughs> yeah, the bad news is uh, 
the loan wasn't for enough. The actuaries underestimated that, and that's why we have such a significant unfunded liability question, because the actual number it took was much more than, than they estimated. And um, so it's just, it's just showing up in a, di in a different form. Um, but it's still good. It still get it good to pay down, and we are making progress, and we are paying it down. And as you see when when you we see when we do the analysis of our pension plans, uh, the the all the employees hired since Pepper in 2013, we have their plans fully funded. The, the, you know we we have our pension programs in as good a shape as any agency in California. So we'll see more of that uh, coming up. Did liaison meet? Normally I know who uh, meets and doesn't meet, um, but tonight I don't. Uh, long range planning. We held a meeting and got an update on um, the, the trails and the um, agreements with the homeowners that surround our portion of the trail. They're making great progress on that and we should have an update uh, very shortly sounded positive. I think there were maybe only, were there only two, um, two of the homeowners who hadn't been contacted yet? Uh, do you have the detail on that? Uh, all the homeowners have been contacted with and we're just working out uh, details with them all. Great, yeah, so they're working out uh, the detail and um, should have more to report back after the next meeting, but it does sound like we're moving in a positive direction. That's all I have. Uh, Director Dransfeld, was there anything else? March 2023 is coming a whole lot faster than <laughs> it, it was a couple years ago. <laughs> so it's just, it's surprising um, how quickly that the, the contract um, will be up because it seemed like so far out. Um, but, but now, you know, we're just months away. Thank you. Personnel? Well, we dealt with one of the issues in closed session yes. and the other, I think Mary will report on, on the classification and pay study that uh, got kicked off. So I think she has the update on that. That's the two things we covered. Policy? Uh, we talked with uh, representatives from ASO and Eagles uh, regarding uh, turf shoe policy at PV Fields. We're trying to reduce wear and tear on the turf so we can get maybe get some more hours of use out of the fields each year. And um, that's what we discussed about doing it. Much more complicated than even I realized. So I always thought, you know, I, my experience is with baseball. So, um, you know, little kids are a lot easier on the field. And um, because they weigh less and they don't impact feel much, but on a, but on a soccer field, they travel around in packs. So they're actually harder on the high intensity area, even though they're, even though they're relatively small and light. Uh, the, the, imp the impact is different. So, um, but anyway, we're, we're working with the two uh, soccer clubs to try and come up with a policy that'll work better, work, work well for them and, and work better for the field conditions. Thank you, Mark. City of Camarillo liaison, was there a meeting? No meeting? Uh, a Miracle League Nothing. and uh, pickleball tennis. Nothing. Okay. Uh, foundation. Yeah, I have a little bit to report. I'd um, like to thank everyone who came out and supported our fundraiser at uh, Snapper Jacks on the 20th of uh, uh, September. Um, the uh, money we raised will go to the uh, nature education for nature. Ed Nature Education Supplies at the Nature Center. <laughs> um, and uh, as Kayleen said, that um, the garage is now down and we appreciate everybody, all the volunteers and especially the staff who helped us to make sure that uh, we were, do it was done right and that <laughs> nobody got <clears throat> uh, injured or anything, so. Uh, and Amber Lights is just, they're an awesome organization that has partnered with 
Pleasant Valley Recreation and Park District, and now they're partners with the foundation, and, and we're really excited about having them. So, um, upcoming events. Uh, on the 29th of uh, October, we're having the Halloween, uh, a uh, dog at the dog park in Mission Oaks, and the foundation has got a professional uh, photographer, and we'll be taking pictures of everybody's pet. So bring your pet out, and the uh, money that we raise from that will be added to our uh, 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 pot of money to purchase the display uh, cases uh, or to for storage supplies, as uh, Kayleen showed. So. Um, then we've got uh, Painting with a Twist is on the uh, 10th of November, and that's always a fun event. We always sell out with that event, and uh, so get your registration in for that. And then um, our second annual Wonderland of Reese auction event will be coming up. Uh, it'll be the November 28th through the, uh, December 3rd, and we're looking for businesses and individuals who'd like to donate or sponsor a custom-made uh, wreath or to... Uh, to uh, sponsor a spot for somebody else to make a wreath. So uh, wreaths are due on the 14th of, of uh, November, and then we, uh, the event flyer and the sponsorship uh, uh, sponsor form are on the website. We now have our own website, the foundation does, but you can go to PVRPD and, and you can still link, it, uh, link to it from there. Uh, so we're excited, and the live auction, well, it won't really be live, but the last day we will be uh, open for viewing, and we will be uh, there with uh, the children having cookies with the classes. So that will be on the 3rd. So, uh, and we're still looking for board members, so uh, if you'd like to, the possibility of maybe joining our board, why uh, we would love to have you. Uh, Director Dransfeld, do you have anything to add? I do not. The, the one thing I was going to say about um, painting with the twist is it is holiday themed. I really love um, the painting that it's going to be. It says joy. And I think it, I want to say it has a wreath on it as well. Um, so I thought that was appropriate. But um, it's, uh, it, it'll be really good. And I'm looking forward to, um, to cookies with the clauses. All right. Um, I, I didn't even realize it until just now. So uh, I was like, oh, that's a, that's a holiday. So, um, but um, I, I think uh, Director Dransfeld was out on Saturday. I wasn't able to make it on Saturday to, to help with the, the cleanup of the demolition. So uh, we appreciate her and the other staff and, and board members that were there. I seen a picture of uh, um, Linda Lamb out there pushing a, a wheelbarrow, so uh, I'll tease her the next time I see her. So, But the foundation is doing good. We're moving forward. We're excited about the, the garage and, and things, so uh, just one more step, and if we can find a contract, someone to do blueprints for us while we can move forward with the permits. So, But thank you to Bob and the staff. Uh, you guys really support us, and we really appreciate that. Is the GM still on the line? She fell asleep. I am. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> some updates. Um, fee study, I believe I sent some information out last week. But currently, we had seen about 320 plus responses. So the, our vendor is working on uh, getting all the information and then we'll be setting a special board meeting to go over all that information and data. Uh, the class and comp study, as Director Magnard said, uh, we've done a kickoff with that. So uh, right now they are asking us for a ton of documents so they can start doing some research. So we will keep people updated as that continues. Uh, some park updates. If you've not been out to our Neal Ranch, the bathrooms are all in, they're open. Um, all the surrounding landscaping is finished, so it's nice to have that project checked off. Um, I want to do a shout out to Nick because I know it took him a lot of time and effort and the staff that put uh, that did all the finishing work. 
Uh, the Lost Post is Equestrian Arena. Um, we worked with Rotary to replace a lot of the post bits out there, so that's taken shape. Uh, turf mitigation at Kildee has been completed. Um, our next project will be Valley Lindo, so working on the scope of that. Um, <clears throat> we've been working with Ventura County Resource Conservation District and in the, in the process of entering uh, with two agreements to do butterfly gardens, both at our Neal, which is the long section, um, and then Laurelwood. So we'll be working with them over the course of the next six to eight months on that project as well. And some recreation updates. Aquatic swim lessons continue to be popular. Staff has been able to open more swim lessons Tuesday and Thursday mornings, which will help with private and then group lessons and um, kids that are at home. Uh, senior, we're starting to see more programming. We have senior bingo on Friday night. Doors open at 4. Sales stop at 5.30 and game starts at 6. Uh, the month of October is full. So we have for seniors the Halloween dance on October 28th from 4 to 6. And then in January, we're already working on expanding program for seniors. Uh, CDBG is uh, currently serving about 120 participants weekly, and we're seeing roughly 10 volunteers that are showing up on a consistent basis, which is very helpful. Uh, special events for the month. Uh, we have back to, or <clears throat> we had in September, we had the 50 plus expo, which was a huge success. Um, that was Brianna's first time running it. Um, once again, a shout out to Brianna, who did a fantastic job, as well as Kayleen getting sponsors. Um, we have Trail and Treat on October 22nd, Spooky Swim on the 28th of October, Halloween, as Director Magner said, on the 29th, and we have our traditional Halloween in the park on October 31st. Um, <clears throat> our customer survey is still online. Currently, we received about 235 responses. We're hoping to receive about 500, but that is going well. Um, on Facebook or even on our district webpage, if you go on there for the first time, one of the things that uh, staff has done is they've put up do you, do you, <clears throat> to enter your name and information. So we've actually ended up with an extra 247 followers. By doing that, we've had an extra 113 that are following us on Instagram. So we're seeing our, um, our efforts work there. Um, <clears throat> other things, uh, community partners, Flying High Pet Resort and Pet Genie are sponsoring the Halloween events on 1029. So we were able to bring in about, I think it was, Caitlin, correct me if I'm wrong, but roughly 4,000 in sponsorships. Is that correct? Yes. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> some just legislative stuff, and I will send this out to the board, um, but AB 152 COVID-19 supplemental paid leave um, that was supposed to expire on the September 30th, that has actually been extended to December 31st. Um, AB 2693 workplace exposure notification that's been extended from um, January 2023 to January 1st, 2024. Um, AB 2449 open meetings, uh, local agencies, teleconferences. So if you remember, we pass AB 361 every month. This is also another one regarding teleconferencing. Um, this goes into effect 2024. I'm actually attending a meeting next month, which will give me look at more specifics because there are some specific guidelines that will go along with this. And this runs through January, 2026. The other one is Senate Bill 1100, which is open meetings and orderly conduct, which, which was passed, which now gives um, a district or a legislative body conducting the meetings to order the meeting room cleared and continue in session if there is some, if anybody is willfully disrupting the orderly conduct of the meeting. And there are certain things that apply to that. So once again, I will send out a brief on each of those to give you a little bit more information opposed to going through a 30 minute spiel on each bill. So with that, I think those are the updates that I have, unless anybody has any questions for me. 
No, we don't have any, uh, Mary, and thank you for that presentation. Uh, Mary, just one more Oh, I'm sorry, question. Bev, I did it again. <laughs> is, um, just for clarification, is the fee study still open then? Uh, no. No, the fee study that actually ended for community for community input on September 30th. So right now, the um, we are working on gathering the information so he can bring that back to the board. Is that the one that we received 235 responses for, or did I hear that wrong? Director Transholt, uh, I believe that was for, for customer, that particular one. It was a little over 200, right about 220 or so responses. The 235 was for the um, survey for the customer survey. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. I was I got those two confused. Thank you. Okay. Uh... It, was that all, Bev? Yes, that's it. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a time uh, for the board members to have a say. I'll start with Mark. Oh, I almost forgot. Well, mine's quick. I only had three meetings in in uh, uh, in September. September seventh, our regular board meeting, um, and actually, I was at the district. Uh, for the Historical Society of Dones and Donias barbecue on the 17th, and I got to sit with former director Rockenstein and his daughter, and uh, September 21st finance committee. Those, that's my report. Okay. <clears throat> um, uh, I was at the board meeting on the uh, 7th, and I also attended the uh, Dones and Donia um, function on the 17th, uh, foundation on the 14th, uh, CSDA on the 16th and the 20th, um, had uh, tacos at Snapper Jack's on the 20th, and uh, personnel on um, the 28th. And Justin, I want to thank you. You did a fantastic job tonight. I think that was your first presentation before the board. and. You did an exceptional job. I, I really appreciate what you did. And the other staff members did a good job too. But I expect that from Lanny and Macy, okay? With, they're, they're the old timers, so. And I noticed there's a young man back there in purple that didn't speak to us tonight, so, or oh, blue. And he's shaking his head, so. <laughs> um, also, I, I just wanna share this with everybody. Thanks for all the calls and everything. I really appreciate it, so thank you. Thank you, Elaine. So I attended the general meeting on the 7th, the financial finance committee meeting on the 21st, and long range on the 28th, and end of report, and Director Dransfeld, you're up. I won't take too long. Oh, I'll go, uh, Dr. Oh, Kelly. You're, you're first, Bev. You're first. <laughs> it's okay. Mine's pretty brief, too. Um, I just wanted to apologize that I'm not there tonight. Uh, I really wish I could. I don't like um, not being in person because there is a different experience um, to it. But um, for meetings attended, I um, attended the monthly meeting, uh, long-range planning, and our foundation meeting on September 14th, uh, September 19th went to the, or attended the Santa Monica Mountain Conservancy meeting. Um, I attended, I didn't realize, um, quite a few events. Um, I went to the City of Camarillo Water Talk on the 13th. Um, they did a presentation of their um, drought tolerant garden, which was, it was actually really interesting to see um, what they've done um, formally in front of the, uh, uh, the city hall. And um, the September 23rd, I went to Food Shares Fed Up fundraiser. Um, they raised quite a bit of money and it was a pretty successful night. So um, it was really awesome to see the facility and all the work they do and, and just really the productivity of such an amazing organization. Um, September 24th, I went to the Pickleball 6th Anniversary Barbecue at Kildee. 
um, October 1st attended the demolition event, um, not as helpful, but I did bring, I think three, four other men <laughs> to do the work that I couldn't do. <laughs> and um, uh, yesterday I attended uh, at the, at Ventura County, um, the, uh, the oath of our new supervisor, Lopez. Um, I just wanted to give a quick, you know, thank you to staff. Um, there's been a lot going on. I know we had a long meeting last week or last month. Um, so just thank you for hanging in there with us and for all the work you do. Um, and, and because it was such a long meeting, really didn't get to express um, thanks for recreation. Um, it, busy, successful summer. Um, very special thanks to our customer service um, representatives in the front because, you know, as it was mentioned, we've been so much busier and it's so exciting to see that going on. Um, a very special shout out to um, John for Camp Fantastic. Um, I, you know, the name, it, it's in the name. It was, it was fantastic. <laughs> um, and I'm, I, I can say that from um, my child's own experience of going through it and, and she loved it. Um, so I'm just, I'm very grateful that she had that opportunity and to get to see um, that come to fruition through her eyes and um, see it actually happen since uh, when I was doing the program, we weren't able to do it with COVID and everything. So I know that there were a lot of challenges presented, but it, I think it went really smoothly. Um, for our foundation poker event, um, very special thank you to the staff, Kayleen, um, all of her hard work. She jumped in. She's so awesome. Caitlin, again, just all the coordination. Um, and, and all the staff members that were there just supporting the event, um, that it was awesome to, to see everyone having fun and um, still supporting the organization. Um, and just gratitude to our community support for Rotary, Amber's Light, City of Camarillo, um, Music Freaks, and you know our list goes on and on. It's just really exciting um, to see every, all those resources being combined. Um, and that's it for me tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Bev. Uh, mine will be short. Um, in the past month or two, maybe it's been three, uh, in any event, we had our um, public meeting on fee increases and so forth, and we've done a study and we've um, put out uh, uh, a, a the, hoping to get information to from the public on what they felt was most important in regard to uh, what they wanted and what they would pay fees for. And uh, of course, the discussion of increase in fees is, uh, was done. And I attended the meeting. I think every board member here attended the meeting. And subsequently, there started uh, individuals in the community started saying things like, um, Oh, the the park district uh, is responsible for a potential 1.5 million loss in the future, um, and it's because they're having sweetheart deals with certain sports groups and so forth. That is not what he said. What he said, it, first of all, it was an opinion based on nothing changing. Secondly, that was over losses that would have been uh, taken from all of our programs, not just these two or three sports groups. Interestingly enough, those three sports groups are the only ones that pay anything to the district. So I just want to clear up that, that misinformation, and uh, I think our local nurse, news service should clear that one up and uh, look into it. And with that, that's all I have for the, rest, for the night. Anyone else? Meeting closed. <laughs>